Hi everyone, this is Dan Halsey with Southwoods Ecosystems and United Designers. This is presentation 1.1, part of our intro to the Advanced Permaculture and Digital Design Series. This is Agroecosystem Strategies, Principles for Building Ecologically Supported Production. This presentation is more of an extension on permaculture principles and ecological design strategies. Uh, getting ready to work in our design system and our design process. So I wanted to go over some examples and some principles of how we think about design as we're going into our design work. Now this involves, like much of our design work does, a new language, new words, new phrases about how we think about design and our ecological systems that we're putting in. Also with that comes a new vision. Hopefully we can see clearly and we can see differently in a better way, hopefully, to build a new future for ourselves and also for the ecology around us, and especially for our clients when we're working on their properties and working for their lifestyle and the vision that they have uh, for their farm or their homestead. So nature's momentum, it's strong, it's relentless. Nature, as in geologically speaking, climatically speaking, the momentum that nature has on this planet uh, has a direction, has a trajectory. And it's best for us to accept the land's imprint on our work rather than imprinting on the land. The microclimates, the sites we're working in all have certain conditions, uh, characteristics, properties, resources. All of those things are what form our design strategies and solutions. We are adapting our goals to the land. Now in a lot of situations, landscape architecture, building and development in general, uh, we do site assessment and in other cases such as I've just listed, they do not. Many times in development, everything is scraped off of the land, the topsoil, everything, a new system is placed on top and then they'll put whatever they have for soil back on top of that. They're imprinting the design on the land with very little consideration for the ecological systems that are there, other than perhaps for drainage. So we are adapting our goals to the land as far as we have already found out from doing our site assessment. We are also going to leverage the ecological functions that are there. If there's a wetland, if there's clay or sand soils, if there's silty loam, uh, hardwood trees, if there's prairie, there are ecological functions and services already established in that area that we can use to create more natural capital and raising the carrying capacity. We leverage the ecological functions that are there to create more services. And using those natural processes, that's what creates the natural capital. That's what raises the carrying capacity and also increases the value of the land as far as growing more crops in smaller spaces, supplying food and forage to more livestock and in the same area. We're trying to raise the carrying capacity by following nature's momentum and using the resources that are there to create more resources. Now the picture here is uh, shiitake mushrooms growing in oak logs underneath some hostas. These were done at our property Oh, in about an afternoon, drilled a bunch of logs, uh, used the plugs for shiitakes and put them behind the house in the shade under the hostas. About the best thing, other than feeding them to deer and covering the soil that I can see for hostas, it kept the logs cool. And so there basically was a microclimate there that was very conducive to growing mushrooms, and we used that. For about three years, these logs produced the shiitake mushrooms, and uh, it was a, a very good system. So microclimates the physical characteristics and the direction that a property is going and even in the mid-succession times, that's nature's momentum and that's what we want to define when we're doing site assessment and use that to support and actually inform our design solutions. Following nature's patterns. Here's a, three little Burman swales going down a hill basically collecting the water runoff from the, the upper areas there in that catchment area uh, before they go down to a culvert in this case. So we do this a lot, working on contour and 
perpendicular basically to the flow of water is catching those nutrients, catching those, the water when it runs off in the rain. That's really the beauty of design and permaculture. And um, whenever we follow the contour lines, the topography, it's an amazing, beautiful sight to see when the trees come up and the shrubs come up on that. And inherent in that design is the ability to catch and store the runoff and then also create more uh, water holding capacity in that area and also more topsoil as the water fills in and we're feeding the organisms and building nutrients in the soil. This is nature's natural arrangement. When we work on contour and we collect the water, we're designing in cooperation and companionship with the land. We're not working against the land. These are on contour with the flow, with the land, and we're not allowing water to escape, but infiltrate. So we're cooperating with the soil, with the plants that are there, and really helping and using nature's pattern to, again, build natural capacity. Now, a couple things, uh, four things, really, I want to talk about in this when we're working on our design work. We'll always have an intention. An intention is basically just a phrase or the verb and usually very vague. So our intention, of course, always is to improve your land for better crops. That's what we're trying to tell our clients most of the time, changing the words a little bit. But that's the intention. But if there's a verb in there, basically that really informs little of the actual activity that's going to happen. And so having a good intention or any kind of intention at all doesn't really go anywhere unless you have a strategy. So in order to fulfill this intention, our strategy would be to build organic material in the soil. There might be dozens of strategies to fulfill that initial intention. It's one of many options, but this strategy is what we're going to do. We're going to build organic material, which is great. And as you can imagine, we still need to break this down because how are we going to do that? Well, we need tactics. And this is the difference between strategy and tactics. The strategy is what we're going to do. The tactic is many, again, many different activities that can happen within a strategy to achieve the intention. So we will grow dense cover crops and deep, deep fibrous roots. Okay, sounds good. We're going to build the soil organically with cover crops and deep fibrous roots so we can uh, build the organic material. That's great. So specifically then, our technique will be we'll chop and till in sorghum Sudan grass for two seasons. That's our technique in doing this. So you can see, as we are looking at our design work, you really have to break it down. What do we want to happen here? What are all the innumerable ways that we can make that happen in order to achieve that milestone? So our, our big milestone really may be to improve the land, but we really have to def decide how are we going to measure that. Well, in this case, in the strategy, we've decided to build the organic material. Remember, if we're working in these areas, perhaps we want to do a soil test. You need to know how much organic material you have. How do you know you've improved the land for better crops through organic material unless you've actually measured it? And measurements is something that's really lacking in a lot of the work that we do. We need to measure things beforehand so we have a baseline to compare it to so that we know that the soils are better, they're richer, they have a higher uh, water holding capacity, all of that. So I just wanted to talk a little bit as we're working with this that we have to be very clear in our design work with our clients and be very specific. Graphically speaking, we can do that in the designs, but there also needs to be probably some kind of narrative or explanation specifically what is going to happen, what materials, and what is the characteristic of the action that's going to reach the milestones and fulfill the goals of the client. So the beauty of permaculture design is in the relationships, and we have a relationship with the land. Nature's natural arrangements on the land are basically like the Burman swales, any kind of landscape feature that works with the land, we're using the natural arrangements of the soil, of the contour, in order to build more resources. We're designing in cooperation and com companionship with the land as we do this. We have a relationship with the land. If it isn't in a relationship, it really doesn't exist. Everything has to be part of a larger system. Nothing is really surviving in isolation 
we all we and the land and every organism every blade of grass is part of a larger ecological system in order to survive we also have to look at following nature's timing and I've been very fortunate the last few seasons to have this uh, on a fairly well established uh, food forest in a number of different places on our land to have this come through and when we're doing design work we have to think of also the seasons how many different harvests can we get over the months of the growing season or even early spring to late fall maybe there are things that we can harvest in the winter time the timing of the plants that we put in the timing of their harvest the timing of their flowering for the different pollinators is very important and something that needs to be charted out so as we're picking our plants think of nature's timing for bloom time fruiting time and harvest time if we can stagger all of those across the season with a lot of different plants we're basically helping all the pollinators all the nectary uh, birds and insects that need that and we're also helping ourselves. so in the case here recently a service berry is just coming into fruit a lot of fun we had a great harvest this year it's been a very wet and humid season and uh, a lot of the berries are, are quite large this year and a lot of the plants have really now come into full maturity and have very large crops a lot of fun to have that at the same time we have nankin cherry a woody shrub those are now coming to maturity and having some great crops off of these again it's a shrub it needs very little maintenance very little pruning and we have some that are growing in the forest that are tall and sleek and we have others that are growing in full sun that are like large wide shrubs it is pretty amazing to see how they change their habit based upon where they're planted but this is a nice harvest to have early June these two things coming in then we have Korean nut pine Korean nut pine comes in let's just say in about 12 years well it takes about 8 to 12 years to actually get the first pine cone on here on these trees depending on where you buy it when you buy it how old it is and then if you do use any kind of inoculation in the soil so uh, Korean nut pine is also on a schedule but that's something we're thinking more long term we still want to get those in the ground and hopefully in 12 years we start to get a harvest and then you have a harvest as these things grow up to 60 to 80 feet tall these are massive massive multi-generational trees that are going to give hundreds of pounds of pine nuts and protein and oil to the people harvesting them over the years ground nuts are something else that we can plant ground nuts you don't even have to harvest them at any certain time you can harvest them anytime now where I live not when the ground is frozen it's going to be kind of diff difficult to get at them but these can sit at the ground uh, layer that they're at for as long as it sit and they're just going to get bigger and bigger and you harvest them on demand last time I see these for sale they were about three to five dollars a piece for ground nuts to get those from uh, uh, I think it was uh, Oikos trees and some other nurseries uh, a pretty good buy to get started with you know three to five of these at a time put them in the ground and in about three years that whole area will be filled with fine pine uh, excuse me small little ground nuts that you can just spread out and start propagating for yourself I actually found these growing underneath a pot that had uh, figs and I was moving the pot for something else on top of the soil and underneath it were all of these ground nuts which is kind of a nice find to have so I'm splitting these up eating a couple and planting the rest out elsewhere to grow more of them honeyberry the first thing that comes in fruiting for us late May early June I think actually probably about mid-May we had our first ones and they're actually still coming off the plant these plants these shrubs that we have uh, related to the honeysuckle actually have a great little blueberry flavor and where we have clay soils we don't have acidic soils it's very neutral basically it's service berry and the honeyberry is our blueberry we have some blueberry, blueberry excuse me blueberry plants also but in clay they don't produce and actually after 13 years they're still only about two feet tall they've just been sitting there barely making it and giving us a little bit of fruit which we prize but isn't it great to have all of these fruit coming at different times and have different harvests nice surprise in the landscape and then we have something like alpine strawberries they start fruiting in late May 
flowering as soon as they warm up. And I've had alpine strawberries in the snow, in the fall. We'll get a snowfall. The snow will melt as soon as it warms up, the plants flower again. And in a couple of weeks, you have more strawberries. It's pretty amazing. So when you look at all these different plants that you can have in, the strategy is timing for pollinators and timing for harvest. And the rest is filling the spaces and deciding how many of these you can fit in to the land and what kind of production you're going to get. As you can imagine, some of these are going to make quite a bit of fruit. Other of them are going to be very selective and high value. If you plant a lot of honeyberry, you can actually get quite a bit of those. And they're a little bit more work to harvest, but actually once you get to it, you can leave them on the tree and just shake them off, much like the Nankin cherry. If you can net that and leave them on the tree to get nice, plumpy and juicy and sugary, basically you can just shake the shrub with a little sheet underneath and collect them just falling to the ground. So nature's timing, thinking of another strategy, another way that we're going to be designing our system. So I wanted to show you this chart. Now this chart is something that I had to produce in order to get uh, my bachelor's degree and actually to get my uh, counselor at the time my advisor to understand what I was trying to do. Because I was working in an area that wasn't about big ag. I was working in an area that wasn't about uh, natural resources, wildlife management, such that. I was working somewhere in the middle. And so on the left here you see research efforts of the low um, and high of research efforts that happen in temperate lands. On the right side you see a severe climates where the niche control is high or low. And there's a little red line that goes across. So the research efforts that are going into annual crops and human use in the temperate climate is obviously very high. Lots going in there. It is a highly controlled space to get as much production as possible. If you go to the other side into what I'm calling big wild, very little environmental control. And I'm not talking about forest lands and where they've planted monocultures of trees, but basically our wild areas where nature is, where nature's systems are working. We have lots of great possibilities to combine these two things. On the left, we have agricultural research, highly controlled niche, human consumption, annual crops, temperate climates. On the right, we have the ecological research, uncontrolled niche, minimal human uses, wild perennials and severe climates, on the right, it's a tough place to grow food, but we can learn a lot from that area as we have in permaculture and ecological design. Nature has its strategies. So we take the natural strategies from the big wild and the organic practices and the better practices of big ag, and we bring those in, and that's what we use in permaculture. It works wonderful for everybody, and everybody wins. Nature wins, and we get the harvest that we need. Polyculture design is part of that, using the natural strategies of nature and the organic practices of agriculture. We are also using, many times, uncontrolled areas, areas out in nature that haven't been used before, but we're not wanting to basically tear everything up, but interplant in these areas. Use the woodlands, planting harvestable crops in woodlands for human consumption. We also have annual and perennial crops to work with in these areas. We mix them together. We're not just growing the annual crops in isolation and monocultures, but we're using perennial crops with them in the temperate and extreme climates. People live all over this world, all over the earth, in all sorts of different climates, and they're all growing food. The strategies inherent in that are things that we can learn from, whether it's from desert practices or people in the Arctic or people in the tropics, or the rainy areas where there's typhoons, places where it's inundated, or maybe they just have swamps or they have uh, water everywhere and they're growing all their food that way. Hot climates, cold climates, all of these are strategies and natural strategies that people have learned of living in that area and then bringing into that organic practices. We can actually grow more food and also help nature by building the raising or by raising the carrying capacity at the same time. So one of the tactics that we look at when we're trying to improve the land 
is capture and store. That's one of our permaculture principles. With water, we're trying to do earthworks and waterworks in order to do this. Much of what we're doing is about reshaping the land somewhat, but not a lot. There's not a lot we can do in reshaping the land, except for a few feet on the top. You know, I guess if we were coal miners or something like that, we could probably just grab the whole mountaintop and scrape it off. But we're trying to create more resources by using the soil that's there, make it deeper and richer. And part of that is drought proofing the property by holding the water in the soil and making it available to the plants and the organisms. So water, we do that with earthworks and waterworks. Also, there's a couple different chain of systems that we use. Now, I really like using the water from our roof. We have gutters that we put on the house here that run to a pond. When that pond overflows, it goes into swales, and that's what waters the berms, as we see in this picture here, for our orchard. This picture was actually taken the summer of 2006, after we planted our, our forest garden. And you can see how tiny all the trees are. There's also with gabions, or key lime. Gabions I saw in uh, South Africa, using those in the watershed, in the ravines. And what was amazing is they weren't damming up the water. They were just using the gabions to raise the water level so that the water would then flow off from channels into basins and into other dammed areas. So they actually took the energy of that water and used it to run it sideways and laterally across the hill to catch basins. So that when they would had extreme uh, runoff and huge rains, the power of that water wouldn't tear out the dams or something that they put in there to stop the water, to hold the water in the ravine itself. These small gabions were just to raise the water a couple feet, and then that water would show, uh, be put off to the sides and channels to basins. Once those basins were filled, the water, basically, water level would come up and the water would continue down the ravine. Gutters on the house to tanks and to drip lines. People have been doing that for a long time. It takes a lot of tanks to do that, to have enough water, but it's still a way to collect water, especially if you're using drip irrigation uh, to plant specifically. It's a great way to collect the water and clean water. And there are some people who are using, of course, the water with a uh, first flush system uh, for laundry and for other purposes in their house. Now, uh, Brad Lancaster has some great books about getting water out of the house. Also about using the water on the landscape. But the house to trenches or diversion pipes from the laundry, from the shower, and other areas in the house, that is something that we can also use in our design and understanding that we need to capture and store that water. Uh, in our course coming up, we'll see a design in North Dakota where the entire landscape around the house is watered with laundry and shower water. That's their system with a family of four. A very dry area that they're in, very windy area, and that water is what's, other than the rainwater, is what's irrigating their entire food forest around their house. So we want to allow nature to do the work for us. We're slowing down the water. We're letting it infiltrate and letting it get into the ground. It's a little like, I like to say, making kefir or kombucha. We're actually letting the organisms do all the work and creating that benefit for us before we consume it. We're catching and storing the kefir grains. We're putting it with milk and let it creating that kefir for us to drink. And what happens? We take the grains out and we start it again with more milk. Same thing with kombucha and the scobies. We put in the ingredients, the black tea and the sugar, and the kombucha actually makes the probiotics for us. So as we slow things down and as we have our systems together, we're trying to allow the resources that we have to enhance themselves and enhance our lifestyle. Here's another example of a system of catch and store, and this is a terrace for a community garden. So I just wanted to show you this because the Berman swale system is very popular in permaculture, can have a lot of different shapes and needs to have a lot of different purposes. There are many reasons why we shape the swales a certain size, why the berm is a certain depth, depth, excuse me, and then also how there's space going down the hill. Okay, carrying capacity I talked a little bit about, and carrying capacity is about how many plants you can have growing in a space, 
how many cattle you can have or horses, say, on a pasture. After you go past the carrying capacity, the resources will crash. There's a certain chart. There's a line. You can only have so many fox based on how many rabbits, based on how much food there is for the rabbits. You can only have so many fruit trees based on the space that you have, based on the nutrients in the soil and the water. If you plant too many things in there, they compete with each other. And then the resources will crash. In this case, when we're working, our carrying capacity is enhanced because we have multi-trophic harvests. And most of the plants that we're putting in, 30% of the canopy, need to be plants that return resources to the soil. Nitrogen fixing plants, dynamic accumulators as in organic material and biomass, carbon going into the soil. We need to return a lot more to the soil than we're taking out, otherwise the system will crash. We also need to build connections between the plants. We want to partition the soil so that taproot plants are next to fibrous root plants. Nitrogen fixing plants are next to the fruit trees or other plants that need that nitrogen. We create, create connections between them. We also maybe need to have nitrogen scavenging plants so that in the fall, when all the other plants are going uh, into the soil and, and dying away in the cold, we have other plants that are there after harvest that are collecting all that errant nitrogen and keeping it in the system. We don't want it to escape. And then we're also regenerating resources. So every time we have a harvest, we also have to consider how are we going to regenerate the resources that we're taking out. Be it nitrogen, be it phosphorus, calcium, those minerals. We need to build compost from the things that we're cuttings that we have. We need to have regenerative practices in order to raise the carrying capacity. This is the second look at that space a few years later. You can see our pear trees. And right to the left of the pear tree is a seaberry nitrogen fixing shrub. And underneath the pear trees, which you can't see very well, or the Baptisia astralis, which is a perennial nitrogen fixer. So we're trying to surround our plants with lots of different types of nitrogen fixers for different times of the year. We also have false indigo and lead plant, uh, prairie plants, nitrogen fixers, that also help the soil and build the plants with diversity. So a linear habitat. Let's talk about monocultures and what that happens, happens with that. This quilt down here of all the grasses, this was done by David Tillman, started uh, around in the early 90s, had been going almost for 30 years, and it's diversity and trying to decide how much diversity is needed to create the most biomass. Each one of these little squares has a different assemblage of plants and a different number of plants. And what was amazing about this is they started out with some of these patches that had 64 different species. Other ones just had one as a monoculture, and they would test for biomass creation in the soil. And after a while, you could imagine the difference between having 64 plants and 32 different species. Was there much of a change in biomass? Not really. So what they were trying to find was the optimum diversity in these patches here to create the most biomass. They went from 32 down into the 20s, down into 16, and actually they found the biggest change came at 9. Seems rather arbitrary. Not a bad number for us to work with, though. So nine different species of plants with, with multiple ecological functions going into our polycultures is a pretty good number. Some of them have five. Some of them have 12. But if we can keep our polycultures to nine, we're creating a lot of diversity, a lot of different types of nutrient richness, and also less competition between the plants as each of them is probably collecting a different sort of mineral in the soil and they're not competing each with each other for resources. So this also buffers disturbance because some plants are better in the cold, some are better in the dry lands, or excuse me, dry weather. So having a diversity of plants also makes the patch more resilient and makes sure that the anchor tree perhaps, uh, or anchor shrub, is getting the needs met that it has because they have enough plants in there that can react to and be resilient in the different weather extremes that we have. So this is a function of using polycultures. On the left of the top, you'll see typically a monoculture. Now this could be scaled in any way you like. This is, uh, could be broccoli, those could be trees, any kind of monoculture in there. The second circle 
is companion planting, where we have three or four different species of plants, and we basically just break up the monoculture by interplanting a few different species of plants here. Now, the benefit with that is if there is a disease in any one of those plants, it will have a tough time transferring to the next same plant because there's a number of them in between. The same thing with infestation of insects, as you can see in the bottom row. There's a lot of space in between one plant to another. So if we have an infestation of insects, it's a lot easier to notice before it's moved across to a lot more plants. You'll see it targeted on these, say, two or three plants where they've been infested, and then you can pull those plants without having to pull others all around that are also probably already infested with that. Same thing goes for disease. Now the third one is actually adding habitat. This is our polyculture. Not only do we have the plants that we want for harvest, but we also have plants in here with ecological function. Nitrogen fixing, dynamic accumulators, maybe aromatic pest confusers, things like that. Uh, all the ecological functions that these anchored trees need, hopefully to help them grow better. But we also have habitat in here. So maybe we have anise hyssop. We have food for parasitic wasps. We have food for other predator type insects and beetles. So that in this space now, it's not just food for us, but we've also created habitat for the predator insects that will take care of the pests that bother our food. So now you might imagine with all of this diversity, we're going to have less production. And it's true that on the left circle, far left circle, you have say a lot of cabbages. But if you get a disease or you get any kind of insect infestation, you're going to lose a lot of cabbages at the same time. If you have diversity, as in the center with companion planting, you will have, say, less cabbage. But overall, in aggregate, you'll have more plants because you have a lot of different plants in there that aren't competing for nutrients and also less infestation, less possibility of disease spread. And so overall, you should have more production of an area with companion planting. When we're working ecologically with polycultures, we're basically trying to reduce our dependence on inputs. We're building our own nitrogen fixing. We're taking care of habitat for the predator insects. We're taking care of this as a forest would. We're basically using forest ecology to guide our design work. This is more of what we'll do in our designs specifically is use habitat in the spaces and ecological function to support the harvest we want on our larger trees and shrubs. There may still be some monoculture gardening. There may still be quite a bit of companion planting, hopefully, in the annual gardens. But we're working in ecologically speaking areas, areas like a food forest, where you're using more of the habitat strategy to get things done and building in the resources that we need to be successful. Let's talk a little bit about plant guilds. Here's a good example on here of a berry plant guild, a blueberry, ligandberry, and bunchberry. Plant guilds are different than polycultures. And basically, plant guilds have relationships. Polycultures are just plants that are existing in the same location, the same patch, the same area as a group. That's a polyculture. Plant guilds actually have a relationship where some of the plants are being beneficial to other plants. Hopefully that's not a parasitic relationship. Hopefully, excuse me, hopefully we, it's a mutualism where they're all benefiting. That's what we're trying to do when we build our polycultures. And we also have human food and mutual support in an ecological system that we're building for this. So in this case, we have the blueberry. We have eight blueberries spaced fairly wide apart because we want to, first of all, be able to harvest them and get at them, but also have good airflow. One of the hardest things in a food forest is that when we have humidity and it's hot and warm and damp, we're going to have fungus, we're going to have disease, and then we're going to have pests. So we need to have good airflow by spreading things out. The ligandberry then, we have five of those, we've spaced in slightly shorter and much smaller than the blueberry to fill in the space between those so that we can have another harvest. And then you see the bunchberry. The bunchberry is our ground cover, filling the rest of the space. And what does that give us? Three different harvests in the same space. In aggregate, much more to harvest, much less competition between each plant for resources, 
because it's not competing with the same plant uh, for the most part. And we have then many more flavors and many more different varieties of berries to have in our diet, many of which may be antioxidant, many may have some medicinal purposes at the same time. So a plant guild that we create in our polycultures are plants that work together in a common goal, either for us to have food or with each other to create resources. Here's another polyculture. This is a summer crisp pear. It could also be a, a honey crisp apple polyculture. And you can see on this design, and this is done in Illustrator, this is much of what our polycultures look like. Uh, now we're using letters, of course, in the symbols as opposed to numbers and not having to renumber all our plant lists. So here we have the center, we have a honey crisp. And initially you'll see that first green circle in the center of this polyculture. That is the plant when we put it in. When you first plant a honey crisp, it might only be two feet across, maybe three feet across. It's not a very big tree. But in 10 to 12 years, hopefully, it'll be maybe 10 to 12 feet across. It's going to really fill the space. In that time of growing, it's had all these other plants underneath it, some of them which may have to move, like the alpine strawberry. We're using that as a ground cover. We're using that to build uh, organic material. It has lights, lots of nice little sticks and leaves that actually help cover the soil and build organic material in the soil. So we have 10 alpine strawberries and a kind of in the sunny side, but they're basically okay with partial shade. And then we have three wild indigos. These are the nitrogen fixers. I'm sorry, we have two of those. The nitrogen fixing plant. We have one right next to the, th uh, to the tree, on the upper left of the tree there. And then we have one farther out in the canopy. The one next to the tree will grow and help the tree as it's growing to give it nitrogen each year, releasing that in the fall as it dies back. And then farther out in the canopy, we have another one so that one's going to grow out in full sun and basically fill the root zone with its nitrogen fixing nodules in the soil as it, the tree is growing. And then once the roots get out there, by that time, that soil will be conditioned and help the apple tree. We put daffodils around the tree. Daffodils have an exit in their roots that basically irritate voles and mice. We're trying to keep the tree from being girdled in the wintertime in our area but it also helps keep rodents away from the tree because they don't like the smell. The same is true, I believe, for crocus and other bulb plants, but daffodil is known to be the best for this. Also then in the spring, you have a cut flower. Uh, you can split them later on. And, and so this is a, putting uh, a dozen, or excuse me, nine daffodils around a tree. You know, within a couple of years, you can start splitting them and moving them around in your food forest and have even more or a potted plant for sale. Now, number five is comfrey, kind of optional, depending. It needs to be very well managed. I love having comfrey underneath all my trees. Most of these plants can't compete with it. The wild indigo will grow right through it. The daffodil is basically done uh, late spring as the comfrey is coming up. But the alpine strawberry cannot compete with comfrey, and it'll just be shaded out and now competed. So comfrey is something that you have to get in there every few weeks and cut to make sure that we're chopping and dropping that material into the soil. And then at the end of the season, all of these plants get chopped, raked up, and composted for good field sanitation. But that's one of our uh, polyculture systems, and this is basically how all of our, our polycultures are built. So here's another polyculture. This is a North Star cherry, and now you can see a lot more plants with this. You can come back and look at this um, when you have more time. But again, look at all those ecological functions and human uses. We have dyes, food, insect repellent, oil, medicine, cut flowers. We also have erosion control, aromatic pest confusers, soil builders, insecticide, um, all sorts of great nitrogen fixing. Uh, let's see what else we have. Insectaries, uh, accumulator, reclamator, lots of ecological functions here with these plants. This is basically a food forest tree with the forest wrapped around it. White wild indigo is our nitrogen fixer. Purple prairie clover is also a nitrogen fixer and a great ground cover. Chives is an aromatic pest confuser. Also, you can harvest that. It's a dynamic accumulator. Daffodils, like we saw previously, to keep away the rodents. French sorrel, you've had that. Great in salads, kind of lemony, but a good ground cover and also a great dynamic accumulator for, for minerals. And we put that and cut that and put it in the soil. 
Veronica, another food, but also a great flowering plant and something that can wrap around the tree. And most of these now are basically feeding insects. Meadow Blazing Star. We have different things flowering at different times. Daffodil, the sorrel, the Veronica, the Meadow Blazing Star. We're feeding our insects now, that the ones that are the predators and also the pollinators. And then our final ground cover on this is Creeping Thyme. Creeping Thyme takes a while and you might want to spread it around quite a bit. But that actually is a really great little ground cover for keeping the soil moist and, and protected. So let's talk a little bit about nature and what it does for us. The last I heard, $30 billion in services are provided to our agricultural system from just natural functions. Ecological services provided to agriculture, $30 billion. Well, if we can use that and we can create that on our own property, we need to make sure that all of these insects, all the pollinators, all of the pest predators are being serviced and have habitat and getting their needs met. If we're going to keep that $30 billion assistance where we don't have to spend that money because nature is doing the work for us because we're being a companion, a good steward of the land, then we need to do these things with pollinating plants and also alternative food sources for pest predators. And we also want to think about below the soil. Think of all the organisms below the soil down there, breaking up their organic material, holding on to nutrients, holding on to nitrogen, basically the worms that are sanitizing the soil, everything that's down there, eating everything else and excreting the things that our plants need. The plants need the elements. They need the nitrogen, the calcium. They're not absorbing the compounds through their roots so much as they need all these different elements to make their own compounds, to make their own organic material as they grow the roots and the fruits and the flowers and the stems and the leaves. All those things are coming from the organisms in the ground, all of which need to be fed. So we need to take care of all of these systems to help us grow our food and also create a resilient landscape. We need to feed those resources. Here we have a strip of uh, comfrey growing around some little fruit trees. There's little cages, if you can see those. Those are little M9 apple trees that will be uh, grafted over time for a little apple wall. But I'm harvesting my comfrey that I'm growing around that to condition the soil. That is feeding resources to the ground, especially when we're talking about the roots that die back and that we're chopping and dropping all around these fruit trees. All of those minerals and nutrients are basically being renewed to returned to the soil. Now, a lot of the nitrogen will gas off, volatize into the air. But organic material and a lot of the minerals will be returned to the soil, plus the fact that the comfrey is covering the soil and helping keep the weeds down, the competition down for the uh, apple trees. So we're increasing the biomass. We're creating organic material through biodiversity, the different exodus that the plants have, and, and also the mycelium. The plants are growing with them and creating diversity underground as much as above ground. We're creating habitat for the insects, habitat for the underground life and organisms. We're creating water retention. The more water we can hold in the soil, to a good point, you know, when it's saturated, but the more water mostly that we can hold in the soil and infiltrate slowly, we'll feed the organisms that we need and also keep the uh, plants well hydrated. Ground cover is the same way. Ground cover is where insects need to go hide and stay as they're brooding, as they're transferring back and forth. It also covers the ground and keeps it cool and keeps more water in the soil. Ground cover is very important for keeping the soil temperature down and evaporation to a minimum. Pollinator plants, for the pollinators, food for them, food for the bees, uh, the butterflies, all of these plants, or excuse me, all of these insects that we need. We need many more pollinator plants on our landscape and now in the woodlands also. Whether we're going to be in there or not, we need to feed the woodlands with diversity of plants. And also, uh, many of them need to be cleaned out, you might say, of invasive species. Some of the invasive species aren't doing a lot of great for, good for our diversity and are outcompeting the native plants that our native insects and native animals depend on. So we need feeding of the resources 
feeding the resources that support us so we can keep that service coming into us. Now, there are a lot of ecological functions that plants have and as they work for us. This is in the plant database that we're using in the course. And we use this to find the plants that we need to provide these ecological functions depending upon the situation that we're in with the plants and what we need. Now, the nitrogen fixers, dynamic accumulators as such, those types of things, insectary plants, those we're going to need all the time. And so we're always looking to increase our list of those and also what's available in our area where I'm working. So we have a lot of diversity and a lot of different functions being covered. Just like Bill Mollison said, we need a lot of plants. Each plant has multiple functions and each function is delivered by multiple plants. We co cover ourselves because each one of the plants we put in will have multiple plant functions that it will help our uh, soil and our ecology where we're growing our food. And then each one of those functions will happen in a number of different plants at the same time. These are available on the plant database as we go and, and look at that. But also you'll see air cleaning plants. Those are amazing. We have a whole polyculture for that, a whole list of plants that you can have in the house that actually clean the air. Take out the toluene, the formaldehyde, and dozens of other chemicals. I was amazed to read this book. They actually studied this at NASA to see if they could have plants on the space station to clean the air, if that would be more efficient than using uh, technology to do it. They found that they needed 16 plants per person on the space uh, station to do that. And I think it was a weight issue at that point to do it. But just imagine cleaning the air in your house with 16 different plants per person. Look nice too at the same time. So you can see a lot of the different features on here. Windbreaks, obviously great erosion control. Either it's going to be chemical assistance, physical assistance, or it's going to be a resource. This is what the plant functions deliver to us. Now, when the plants are giving us all these things, it's amazing we get into nutrient cycling because it is so simple a concept. And it's so amazing what happens when we nutrient cycle. Here's what comes to our table on the left. Gifts from the garden. Fruits and vegetables, juices, pulp, vitamins, minerals, fiber, flowers, oils, medicinal herbs, storable foods, spices, honey, wax, uh, community activities, birds and amphibians, all sorts of beautiful things happen from the garden. And what does the garden want in return? Soil from kitchen waste, compost from the landscape, mulch from grass clippings, perhaps cardboard and paper that we can shred, water from our roof gutters, transplants from other lands bringing in native plants and unused organic material. All we have to do is return to our garden in bulk, in raw materials, what then the garden turns into all of our harvestable materials to bring to our table. It's pretty amazing and not hard to do. Using that compost pile, keeping the water going, raising the carrying capacity of our garden space by just adding more and more mulch, more organic material, and keeping it alive and going. It's amazing how little our gardens are asking of us in order to produce all these great services. Now, this is one of the permaculture principles I want to talk about because it's very important when we're working on our properties and working on our designs to use the edges and value the marginal. Lots of areas and spaces that we see on the design that other people are ignoring that are very valuable to us. Fence lines and such things, as I'll talk in other presentations, a lot of nutrients there. A lot of birds have been manuring for a long time. Phosphorus, minerals, all sorts of things on the edges. It also is where the energy is collected in these transition zones. That's where it's like a brush you see in the grasses collecting the sand, but also it's where the nutrients are falling. Uh, shorelines, lines from the forest to the edge of the meadow. All these areas are hugely productive spaces to work with for us. And also, in our case, might need some help. Valuing the marginal is very important too. Marginal lands have been left and abandoned. They are perfect for what we're trying to do. Marginal lands are just sitting there waiting for somebody who can creatively use them and understand what the biology is, the ecological system is, that will help enhance that space for food production, but especially, ecologically speaking, bringing in more diversity, bringing in more ecological services and functions for nature itself. 
building nature in these areas of this marginal land, but then also we would probably get some harvest for ourselves at the same time. Creatively use and respond to change. Now this is interesting because a lot of times this comes from problems, accidents, all of which are opportunities. This is a sewage canal in China and John Todd and his Eco Machines worked on this. Now you can imagine the property values on a sewage canal are not great. Uh, and the point being is, what is this space? What can we do with this space? We need to change it. This is a problem. This problem also has the solution. This is sewage. What is sewage? Overloads and toxic nutrients. What's the problem with it? It's not moving. It's sitting there. It's becoming rancid. And all those great minerals and nutrients are becoming anaerobic and basically poisonous to most living things. So what do we do with a sewage canal? We turn it into a park because all those nutrients can be absorbed by plants. So here we have a raft of plants from all the way down this canal. And then you also see aeration bubbles on here and a little shed down there in the back. So we add oxygen to this area. We add plants to absorb the nutrients and we actually have a sewage treatment plant that is actually at the same time a garden space. Pretty amazing. Many times the garbage and the waste is just ignored nutrients that can be cycled and needs to be cycled back into our systems. The problem is the solution. Problems arise from competing relationships. Now this sometimes can be an issue, and especially when you talk about nature, it's kind of rough. Things compete with each other. A wolf's solution is a moose problem, as you can imagine. A wolf needs to eat, and a moose doesn't want to be eaten. Some of these things come up all the time, but there are also opportunities. Nature is pretty rough. When you think of all the predation going on out there, things in dying, being absorbed, and being cycled back into the system, the problem is also, though, the solution for us. Problems are opportunity. Feedback from nature's quality control is what we see when we see aphids, when we see uh, insects, when we see disease and things like that. That means we need to manage something better. We're not doing something correctly. So that's really good feedback. It's motivation for lasting change. Did I plant these trees too close? Do I need to change the style that I'm working? It's an opportunity to improve because we're getting this problem showing up I need to get rid of this problem, so I obviously need to change or improve my tactics, my strategy, or the process that I'm working. So I can look at this problem and see how I can improve myself or improve my system, and also working for other people. It obviously is an opportunity for a new paradigm. If things are coming out of the blue that you don't understand, the first thing that's got to change is your belief system. You need a new paradigm of how the systems work and how the plants work together and something is not going well, it's probably misunderstood or it was ignored or maybe there's some strategy there that's out of alignment. So it's an opportunity to make lasting change. Um, a lot of times we'll find things that happen to us and we wonder why and sometimes we have to figure out. One of my good stories is about frozen pipes. I live in Minnesota. Uh, one winter, get up in the morning, hear that spraying sound understand what that's going on and we have some frozen pipe. The frozen pipe was laying on top of the dryer vent. When the dryer vent wasn't running and blowing air out of the house and a fan was on blowing air out of the house in one of the bathrooms, uh, as we do that to get rid of the humidity, if the fans are running, it actually is bringing cold air in. And when we have extremely frigid weather, that minus freezing uh, air is coming in through that vent, being pulled into the house, and actually was freezing those pipes. Big change had to happen. The other part was is we actually didn't need to exhaust that air outside. We need the humidity in the wintertime, and we had a subfloor area, and with the addition of filters and some more ductwork, we were actually able to recycle that air from the dryer back into the furnace room to be used for heating and adding humidity to our house without adding the lint, without adding that, the dust or anything from the laundry, but really recycling that moisture right back into the house instead of using a humidifier. So we actually got a good benefit from finding that problem. 
basically a big paradigm change for me, uh, reducing the negative air pressure in our house so that it actually wasn't bringing in cold air to begin with. And our furnace worked less and we had to, didn't need to have an expensive humidifier because we were using the water from the laundry. Also, by the way, that can happen if you just hang the laundry up in your house in the wintertime uh, when it's dry. And we do that too now. We have uh, uh, clotheslines for doing that and you don't need a dryer at all. So problems are also indicators. Weeds are indicators of, of uh, the soil if it's compacted, if nutrients are missing. Certain weeds show up when soil is disturbed. Certain weeds show up when there's a lack of calcium or a lack of nitrogen. Those weeds then will also change because those, the job of those weeds is to change the soil itself anyway. So that soil will change. Uh, insects are also indicators when aphids show up and many times when we have an infestation of insects on some of our garden plants, something is wrong there. Even many times from overwatering or the plant's defense systems have not been allowed to work to keep the insects off um, or something is wrong with the plant itself. Insects are indicators though of, of something's going on in that system and something that we probably need to correct. Uh, there are a lot of ways of getting rid of those insects, of course, with using reme, covers, and especially pest predators, and using polycultures and interplanting. The last thing I wanted to mention about people as indicators, a lot of people that you may know and I know are actually what we would call canaries. They are indicators of problems with smell, with chemicals, even with radio frequencies, RF signals in the air, uh, the G5 or the, excuse me, the 5G system coming out now. I understand a lot of people are highly sensitive to that. We need to really watch people who are the canaries in our life that are highly sensitive to those things that may be harming us, but we are less sensitive to it. So people are also indicators of systems that are breaking down. And it's good to pay attention to people when they highlight either water, smells, sounds, or even their observation of behavior. People can also be great indicators of problems in helping us and solve them. All right, let's talk a little bit about functional spaces. And by the way, you can take this uh, video and slow it down and come back to any of these at any time. And if you have questions, go to the comments below this video and ask your questions, have your comments uh, about things that we can fill in, other things that you might like to know or that need to be explained uh, in more detail. Uh, you can also add it in the Moodle forum or any of the Facebook pages too where we have our resources. So be sure to take notes and look at some of this. And if there's something that's not quite clear, of course, I want to know that so we can do a better job and make sure that everybody's informed and any of the gaps that might be appearing. So when we work on our designs and we have our base map done, phase two of our base map work working into our design system is functional spaces. This equals a functional design. When we're going from patterns to details, the first pattern we want to make is what is the function of each area that we've designated on the property. Later on, we can decide what elements it needs to create those functions and the products that need to come from that area, but we need to decide and size the functional spaces on the property. Along with that now comes allowment, allow, <laughs> you need to allow for movement, human access. Number one, how are we going to get around on this property? Access is first. How wide do the paths need to be? Where are the paths going to be? And what kind of carts or equipment are going to use these paths? As you can imagine, each farm size, each type of system is going to require a different set of equipment. And that equipment might vary in size anywhere from two or three feet wide to eight feet wide. Maybe it's 12 feet wide if we have a large tractor. All those things need to be considered to allow for movement in our designs. Human access, excuse me, access especially so that we can get around within the growing spaces. So when we're drawing our functional spaces, there are spaces in between those spaces, perhaps maybe even within the functional space that we need access to get in with equipment, to get in with harvesting and carts. Uh, on my own property here where we have berms and swales and we have lots of fencing, 
I always have to keep in mind that I need at least eight feet comfortably. I could get by with six feet, but I need eight foot access between any two features and in order to drive my little tractor through there. I have a little garden tractor with a trailer. And if I'm using that for harvest or moving material around, I want to make sure that I can get through. That's why I have a principle here and a guideline. I have to have at least eight feet between these elements so that I can drive around and get through with my equipment. That's very important in our design and our functional spaces. We also need the collection of water, sun, and heat. Allow for the use and banking of resources. If we're collecting water, pond size, swales, areas where we're going to collect the water in basins need to be sized correctly so that we can bank that water for infiltration or possibly later use. We also need to have unrestricted growth space and succession for plants, allowing trees to grow. Planting things too close is never a good idea. Just because this tree is going to grow eight feet wide does not mean we plant them eight feet apart. It's better to have extra space in between and add a smaller shrub or smaller plant to fill that space than to put trees and shrubs too close together. If you do that, we don't have good airflow. We have humidity build up and we also have transferring of disease. And we also have shade and other issues when we put things too close. So we want unrestricted growth space. Laterally speaking, and especially with trees, spacing them out well. And if we have some extra space, putting in a small shrub, currants, blueberries, whatever it might be in between those trees is better than putting them too close. Now, supportive resources. Every time we have an action in our property, every time we have a functional space, it has needs. So those needs need to be met and those needs to be supported. And if they are, then we have a higher net yield of all the features. So our supportive resources provide this high net yield of all the features. It supports the other plants, birds, beneficial insects, buffers, weather changes, needs no minimum outside resources, uses low level management. Our supportive resources are within the system itself. Each one of our systems creates a new system or is created to do these things, like buffer weather changes, or in itself is resilient to that. We want systems that need no or minimum outside resources. They create their own nitrogen. They create their own windbreak. They have their own condensation, perhaps, for water coming down. Organic material is plentiful in a space where we have trees and shrubs and perennials, and we can cut, chop, and drop and create compost for that. It also uses low-level management for vacated time. Sometimes we need to leave for months. If we're doing a forest garden or we're doing a design, guess what? You should be able to leave it. And I know even in my space, when I'm gone for some weeks doing design work somewhere else, I miss the harvest. I won't get any elderberries. I won't have any cherries that year. Basically, I was out working somewhere else. And where did they go? They just went to nature. The birds basically got most of them. I'm always sharing anyway, but if I'm not going to be there, I can just imagine all the birds came and they had a heyday, having a lot of great food that year. And by the way, they're spreading them around my property and their manure. So I have seeds all over and I have elderberry and other plants popping up in all sorts of places on our property now, which is all good. So cycles all resources within the property. Being a supportive resource, being supportive design means that nothing leaves our land. Glass, metal, and plastic might go in recycling. All other organic, organic material, even paper, is made into compost. We use it for bedding for the goats. I use it for uh, bedding for the worms. They turn it into soil. The goats turn it into fertilizer and manure. Very much amazing. Uh, nothing needs to leave the property other than these fabricated materials. Everything else, if it's organic material, goes into the appropriate compost pile. Now I want to take a little break here and uh, if you grab a little piece of paper we're going to do an exercise and you can stop this video and pause it uh, at any time. What I'd like you to do is to take a piece of paper and list the garden foods you grow. Just list 10, 12 is about all. And then sketch that garden. 
very quickly. What are the plots? What are the plantings? Just little circles, little labels. And then ask yourself, is this your definition of a garden? And where did that garden definition come from? So sketch that out. Just stop this for a minute. Grab a pencil and paper and turn it back on and then we'll proceed. Okay, you have your drawing. Great. So you have your drawing. This is what your garden looks like. And I just want to show you uh, a couple examples and ask some questions. So you may know somebody or you may yourself may know how to arrange flowers. When we look at how our flowers are arranged, you can just tell when it's right. But if you know the system and you know how things come together, we have color. You can see the green framing it with the leaves, the different colors of their spread around or grouped. See the groups of three, one, three. There's two roses there, how they're spread around. It's a nice arrangement. And we intrinsically recognize it as a nice arrangement of plants or flowers actually here. So then we look at a garden. And this is your typical garden uh, in a magazine. And you see all these straight rows and all this bare soil. And basically, this is supposed to be the perfect garden. But where did this perfect garden come from? In planting a garden in straight lines, we don't, we're not going through this garden, obviously, with a John Deere tractor. Uh, there's doesn't really need to be that much space and the soil is dark and bare and you just imagine how hot that soil is also. It's weed free, no ground cover, but we see this as orderly. We see this kind of design in gardening and you can either just straight rows of the same plant is orderly, but this actually creates ecological chaos in the soil for the plants there's no benefit from the plants to each other. The soil is hot and it's dry. Um, it adds a huge amount of stress to the roots of the plants for water collection. Um, just imagine the temperature of the soil and what that's, trans what that's doing to the plants themselves and transpiration, slowing it down. So if this is how we've learned to design, it's a cultural practice. It's a cultural aesthetic that's been put upon us as opposed to something that we might do if we just came out of our head and designed normally. And some cultures have actually done this. One of the things that happens when we, when we design this way, um, and this happens a lot in community gardens, is that we have issues with the season just like with the plants. So when we first put a garden in like this, we really have control issues in the spring. We have it nice and neat. We have our little lines going across and our strings on stakes and things like that. And then by the time July comes around, we have anger management because things aren't doing what we want. The weeds are coming in. And by the time we get to the fall, we're not having our needs met anymore. So this whole beautiful thing that we thought was going to be nice and neat, nature has been trying to leave since the day that you put it in. Well, let's think about that. Is there another way to do this that makes more sense. And there are, of course, many, many different ways of doing that. One of the ways that people garden is with the keyhole bed. Ergonomically designed, usually it's about 8 to 10 feet across, as far as you can reach. It's designed by the length of your arm. And where the plants grow in here are designed by what's growing and how often you pick it. So microgreens, salads, and peppers all those kinds of things, lettuces, radishes, uh, those are in the first row. We'll call that zone A. That's right in the center there. That's the thing you're going to be picking every day and messing with. Zone B, peppers and beans, peas, things that are go shrubby and grow a little bit more, grow bigger. And then C is cabbage and onions and carrots. Things are going to take a little bit longer and you're going to thin, but they're going to take the whole season. And then on the outside, D is basically what we call 
taggots, nasturtiums, wormwood, tansy, things that are uh, aromatic pest confusers or they're trap crops for uh, the plants. So this is a keyhole bed. And what's nice about working in circles is that circles go well together and they create spaces. So going from site analysis to the design process, this is how we're working with these principles as we're going forward. We'll be looking at this a lot and repeatedly. Number one, the base map. Hardscapes and permanent structures. Getting those drawn in, getting those sized up, and getting them on our base map in Illustrator or in pencil. Then doing our bubble map, which is where we start to work with our spaces. That's our functional spaces. Loose lines, functions, access, and goals. Remember, access is first on that. But when we're doing that bubble map, it is really just elbow work, lots of circles, just generally labeling things where they're going to go, because we're going to probably do that three or four times. Then the concept plan. This is where we're using hard lines to denote transition areas from planting areas. Hardscapes are defined. All those bubbles that were there are now more refined to production areas. Those are polyculture patches. Those are outlined. We have our paths in there now. That concept plan we really need to size things very carefully. And now we're taking the bubble map of our functional spaces and actually deciding what specifically those functions are and the sizes and their orientation with the rest of those spaces. The first draft we're doing then is we start putting in the, the plant guilds to fill those concept spaces, putting in the plant types, their purpose, width and dimension. This is the circles. We're filling those spaces. And if we're doing that in pencil, a lot of the time we're just putting in empty circles. We're deciding this is a tree, the type of tree, the type of shrub, but we're not giving it a species type. If we're working in Illustrator and we have these spaces, we can originally just come in and start drag and dropping polycultures and drag and drop plants in there from the symbol library. We can immediately start to put plants in there, moving them around and playing with that because we have that option. It's very difficult to have that option in pencil. So in pencil, we draw circles, get all of our dimensions right, then we decide what plants those are. Whereas in Illustrator, we can start filling that space with plants right off the bat, learn how they fit, take things out, exchange things as we develop our guilds and start moving around our polycultures in there. Once we do onto our final draft, we have our final plant selections. We decided what's in there, what the shapes are, and we're labeling things, labeling areas with names. One of the things when we do our narrative is we actually have to name the spaces because we have to be able to communicate with our client and with the farm manager what area we're talking about, listing the plants in there, the timing and all the different activities that have to happen in either installing that area or managing that area in the coming seasons. The completed design may have rendering, may have shadowing, other details in there bringing in some color, more color or more detail. Most of the time, the final design is what we're showing the client, and there may be a little more work that we're done doing in the completed design based on any changes they might have. The last thing we're doing is the final narrative. Once our design is done, now we need to do the supporting documents. Now we need to get the plant list, the timelines. If there's a watering system, really writing that final description of each one of those named spaces to what the client is going to get and what they can expect with that. Many times, we are not the installers. The client may be installing it. We are just giving them the design and the narrative to work with. So, a last few points on this. To think about the niche or the function is what defines the plants. We need to define the function first. What is it that we need to happen in our functional spaces? That will tell us what plants are going in there. The plants supply the ecological functions and the human uses, and the functions and uses achieve the design goals. These three lines can go back and forth, can be read even backwards if you wanted to, because we have to know what our design goals are first, correct? And if we're going to get to those goals, we need to know what the functions and the uses are of the land. And then we'll find the plants that supply those functions and uses. And those plants 
will go into the functional spaces in order to deliver that area. So there's a lot of things that we need to go in order and also checking ourselves to make sure that we're getting our functions taken care of and our human uses supplied to our clients or to ourselves to achieve our design goals. Another thing to, re to remember is that use limiting factors as design drivers. Ecological functions provide the solutions for our design drivers. A design driver is such that a power line might be, in some cases, a limiting factor. The power line may be, have a limit of 25 feet for any tree underneath. High tension power lines, 25 foot limit. And you need to stay out of their easement, by the way. Um, so if we're going to do that, it's a design driver. We have an erosion issue. We have a south facing hill. We have a gully. Call them design drivers. They are driving our design. They are not limiting factors. It's very irrelevant how it got there, what's going on there. It's a driver for us to uh, resolve and bring in solutions. It's really limiting us, not so much as it's guiding us in a way to do things. The type of soil we have, if I'm working on sand, that's not a limiting factor. That's just the soil. If I'm working in heavy clay, that's the design driver. Mostly limiting factors come from our preferences and what we're used to. But let's just say all of the site conditions are the design drivers to help us get to our solutions. So here's a limiting factor that we might see. Dry soil. What it is as a design driver? Improve soil moisture. We need to bring in plants and systems to improve the soil moisture. Steep slope might be a limiting factor. Design driver. We need soil, soil stabilization. That's needed in many cases, any kind of ridges, areas where we have uh, especially sand and blowing wind, any kind of wind erosion, water erosion, soil stabilization also. Minimal time. If that's a limiting factor, actually our design driver is low maintenance. We need to save time, lower inputs and things that are getting done. Low soil organic material. Soil building is a design driver. What plants build the soil? Just like what plants do soil stabilization. That's the driver for picking out our solutions and picking out our plants. Limiting factor is wind. Wind breaks are the design driver. Anything we probably will put those in uh, as a defense against high winds during extreme weather. But generally speaking, in some areas, the wind is constantly blowing. In some areas of the United States and all across the world, wind breaks need to go in and they are a design driver for what might otherwise be seen as a limiting factor. Once we have our design drivers in, that reduces that limiting factor to perhaps not even being a factor anymore because we've taken care of that with our initial designs. So that's it for this session. Uh, remember that you can email me with questions. You can go on the website, halsey1.com, uh, if you want more information about this course and joining us. Uh, if you're interested in the design services, southwoodscenter.com is where the design portfolio is. Uh, this is Dan Halsey with Southwoods Ecosystems and United Designers. And I'll see you on the internet. And hopefully, uh, if you have any questions, you can send them to me and I'll make sure that I get them to the rest of the class. You can also put them in the comments. Thank you very much. Habitat and other plants. This is a design I did for... Uh, a Native American community and obviously with medicine wheels and the round garden and the circular nature of the patterns within the Native community and the work that they do, obviously it made so much sense and they were the first organization to actually let me do one of these mandala gardens. 2,500 square feet, 200 foot fence going around it. Now the perimeter path actually went away. We don't, didn't even use that after a while. Didn't need it uh, because we had that secondary path as you come in and walk through the first perimeter gardens. That going around gave access to both sides and we actually used that perimeter path to grow more crops and also grow things along the fence line. Eight foot diameter center gardens. Those are the keyhole beds. 17 of those keyhole beds and 15 of the outdoor outside perimeter beds. So with 200 feet of sheep fencing, 
uh, rabbit fencing at the base to keep the rabbits out. And we also put the compass, or excuse me, the fence posts on compass points. What an easier way to put them in, north, south, east, and west, and then just keep subdividing the circle until we all have our compass points in. The posts are about six feet apart, which is pretty close, except when you think of the tense uh, pressure on these posts from going in a circle, and we're trying to pull that fence tight. It actually is pulling those posts in rather than going lengthwise. So we had to put those posts a little closer together, but that's okay. It worked out quite well. But this is using keyhole beds and then also perimeter farming for more community gardens in this space. And it worked out really well. Thinking of different ways, we've had people actually say they've grown more food in this little eight foot circle than they've ever done in a 10 by 10 or a 12 by 12 garden space. Mostly because there are no paths, they could intensely plant it and they could use it however they wanted. And they were only growing in this little space, things that made sense in that. And corn and other, the large things, zucchini, were being done as a community outside in the perimeter fencing. We have this as a PDF, and I think it was about $1,500 to put in this community garden when we did this. Did about a dozen of these in the Twin Cities, and also I think in Omaha and in Greece. They also were promoting these for their community gardens there. So when we think about design work, think of getting out of the box, working in curves, working in sync, uh, circles, and thinking of a cellular way of working rather than a geometric way. Not that there's anything wrong with sacred geometry, straight lines, mathematical equations, putting things together, a crystal lake, or like you see with the beehive, hexagons, things like that. But mostly, they're just kind of squared off circles. And that's what we're working with. Think of the design as an organism. And all of these are features that need to be connected and interconnected, like the organs and the interior of a living organism. Okay, organic material, one of the services that we're getting. This is a little chart that I found. Um... A Mechanistic Approach, New York, uh, Wiley Publishing, 1984. So it was a paper. This is the return that we get from having a percentage more of organic material in the soil. From 1% to one and a half to 2. Look at that chart. This is pounds of nitrogen per acre. 20 to 30 pounds of nitrogen per percent increase is what you're getting returned to your plants. It's being held in the soil. And every time you go up, you have that many more pounds of nitrogen available to the plants. Phosphorus per acre, 4.5 to 6.5 pounds for every 1%. Sulfur per acre, 2 to 3 pounds for every 1% you go up. So every time we add a half percent, 1% going up in organic material, you have so many, many more pounds of nutrients added to the soil and held there for them. That is held in the system. It is held by the nutrients in the organisms. It is held by the, the organic material. It's made soluble by the organism so the plants can absorb it. All of these things are a benefit from increasing organic material in the soil, which is what? Natural capital, which does what? Raises the carrying capacity of the soil and the land. Organic material is huge with that. We want to change the color of the soil. We want to have a very rich, rich soil, smelling rich, looking rich, holding water, and also holding materials better for our plants. Now you're probably familiar with this, permaculture principles. These are David Holmgren's, but I'd like you to look at this a little differently as I've broken them up into three groups, passive, proactive, and progressive principles. Now the passive ones or we're basically within an existing system. So it's like on a roof line. Uh, I want to add a catch and store system of gutters. I'm adding that to an existing system. I'm going to observe and interact with my system. I'm going to, maybe it's a place I just moved into. And it's in existing systems, we have to be aware of how they're working and see if there's adaptations or enhancements that we can do to create a better system. We also need to apply self-regulation and accept feedback from these systems that exist and even the new ones that we put in. 
Uh, accepting feedback, all feedback is good, as you know. Uh, having no feedback is basically ignorance, and we don't know what to do, and we'll not know when things are going wrong, so we do want all the feedback we can get. Applying self-regulation also means we can uh, limit consumption. We can limit what we're doing in order to have more later. Uh, not making one big cherry pie off of this year's cherry harvest and be done with it. Um, actually self-regulating so you can have cherries as a flavoring. I do that with most of our fruit, except for the apples and the pears. Uh, they're basically many times just the base material for making jams. But all of the sweet berries that we have here, we can them and use them for flavoring in breads, yogurt, kefir, uh, kombucha, um, all sorts of different things. And so that's a great way that we can regulate how quickly we use it, but also still have the benefit and the flavor of all these great uh, products off our land. And then also producing no waste from an existing system. If I have a system that's running, how can I take that excess, whatever's coming off of it, and use that in a way where it's not waste, it's actually a resource. So we don't produce waste, we produce resources. And then being proactive from an existing system, redesigning it to obtain a yield. Perhaps there isn't anything coming from a certain system that's going on the property now. Say the gutters are going off just down the street. Say that the, uh, the grass is just being sent away in a bag with the waste. All these things we can obtain a yield from if we just be proactive and redesign these systems. Use and value renewable resources. Of course, as much as we can for that, reusing, recycling, and of course, I'll probably go back a lot to limiting consumption and limiting our choices so that we can create a smaller footprint. Design from patterns to details. This is big with us. We start with patterns. We have to make pattern type decisions and then we keep breaking it down into more and more detail. We don't make detailed decisions until we have our patterns done. We don't decide what the species of plants are we're putting in until we know the functions of those plants and the spaces they need to fit and the site conditions that they're in. Those things guide us to the correct plants, but first we have to decide the pattern and the function and the goals of what we're doing on the property before we can start picking out specifically what plants. Integrating rather than segregating, working systems together, making sure just like the chickens and the gardens and the compost, everything can work together and enhance each other's properties. And then being progressive, developing new systems. Now in this case, of course, we want to start small, and slow with our solutions so that we can watch them. And of course, any of these good systems that we have that are working should be scalable. If it doesn't scale up, then there's probably some issues with that. But use slow and small solutions. Don't put in 300 apple trees because you want to have an orchard. Don't get 20 goats. Maybe you want to start with three, and I mean three trees or three goats. Uh, start small, learn the systems, and then grow slowly so that you can adapt as you go forward and understand the difficulties of scaling up when it comes to your time and resources. Use and value diversity in all cases. We'll talk a lot about that with polycultures, but also diversity in plants, diversity in resources, diversity in access, all sorts of things. We need to value that and actually create it and look for that. Use edges and value the marginal. We love fence lines and we love land that's been left fallow or just abandon a lot of these great places are good to work and we'll, we're going to look at some more of these we talked about this and we'll look more of this in, in the presentation and then creatively use and respond to change lots of great great ways of doing that change is inevitable change is coming as we know in many areas we need to be creative in doing that and build resilience as we go the permaculture principles still apply and then of course we have all of bill mollison's too on this. These are great things to think about to guide us in our goals. And again, back to our intention that builds these strategies that we need.